Man, it's nice to see so many folks out here. I didn't expect this many. Awesome. Appreciate you guys taking time away from the show to come over here and talk some elk. This one here, this discussion, we're going to be a little bit different than yesterday's. Yesterday's was about slow playing bulls. And today we're going to talk more about elk sounds. And actually the very ones that I try to bone up and master on, because I only use a handful of them come the elk season, I, I want to identify them all in case I hear elk in the timber and I don't see them and I can tell what's going on. But as far as myself, I actually really polish myself up for five, six, maybe seven sounds sometimes. And I'm going to share those sounds with you. But at, uh, first of all, though, my name is Paul Medell, and I'm the owner of Elk Nut Outdoors. And I've had it for about 20 years, just kind of a little bit of a background. Uh, I started getting into elk in the 80s. We, in the McCall area where I've lived most of my life, we'd have maybe 15, 20 elk come in and they would, they would migrate out. They would stay in that valley and you know how McCall can be, four or five feet of snow. So I started feeding them because I kind of felt sorry for them and the snow's this deep and I mean these things couldn't even move and so they were staying on the back part of my property. Well in time, other people around the neighborhood, which was not a neighborhood, but you know other people in the area, started donating hay and we would feed these elk. I would feed these elk in the morning and the evening. After about two or three years, they got to about 75 head. And I think these elk, because some were staying, others started staying. And all of a sudden I had like 75 head and how do you feed 75 head of elk? I mean, there's, that's a lot of animals. So Fish and Game came to me and they said, if we put up a, a, an eight foot pen on the back of your property and supplied you with the necessary feed, would you feed them? And I said, sure. I mean, it sounded like a blast. This is in the early 80s. So we're talking a long time ago here. And at that time, they brought me 70 ton of hay. And, in, and, and during each year I did it for the next five years, they went, those elk went through 210 ton. And the fishing game would come in. Oh, the, I, my property didn't have a road, so they would plow it out to bring that feed in. Well, people started coming from everywhere because you could walk right up to these elk. I mean, there was nowhere for them to go. And so they were staying back there. And man, I could hear them talking. You would not believe. I mean, we're talking December, January, February, and even parts of March. These elk would just, I mean, they're bugling, they're doing everything. And you would think, oh, they don't do that much communicating, but they really do year around. And so it was a really good thing to experience. Well, that kind of whet my appetite to want to know more. And so when it came to June, July, August, I started going out in the woods with no hunting season and trying to learn a little bit more and listen to their vocalization. And I started doing this for a couple of years. And one day I got home, I wouldn't get home till one o'clock in the morning. And one time my wife came over to me and she says, huh, she says, you're just an elk nut. And that's how I ended up getting the name. And so that's where Elk Nut Outdoors eventually came from. And, and I thought, you know, that's just a little background there of, of sitting with these elk for so long and listening to their communication. So I didn't go to college for it or anything, but I, I learned the trial and error, listened to them, really paid attention. And it kind of carried over into my hunting seasons. And then there, it came to the point where my son and I would be hunting and we were killing bulls. And then we would help others. And, and the next thing you know, we were killing six, seven, eight, nine bulls a year. Every single year we would kill them with our bows. And people were wondering, how are you guys doing it? I mean, most people weren't killing elk like that. And I told them it was the elk vocalization. I figured out what the, what the uh, sounds are that cows make and bulls make to the best of my ability at that time and come hunt season I was using it against them you know I mean just like if you were to go to another country and learn their language I was learning the elk language well as time went on it went into DVDs and CDs and stuff and so it, it kind of came into that realm right there and the next thing you know I'm giving seminars everywhere where people know I'm doing this and, and one thing led to another and now this is almost 20 years later from when we first started and so I enjoy, you know, talking to people like yourself and, and, and people have seen that my son and I have taken 61 elk in the last 27 years. And mo these are basically all bulls. I think there is a cow or two in there in the early part. And we've killed them all with our bows, all public land, over the counter elk. These are not, no ranches or private. We get no special privileges. And so I boiled it down to some certain sounds that we use every year. And you guys can do the same thing. And I'll share those sounds with you. I'm gonna share the sounds I use, which is only a handful of them. But I wanna know all the sounds that elk make. And so, but I realize in hunting them every year that I don't need to know how to make all those sounds. I don't need to know how to glunk. I don't have to really know how to just do nothing but growling or some of the special, uh, 
effects you might get from the different ranges of emotion of bugles. I just need to key in on a few. But if I hear certain sounds out there, because I hunt a lot of dark timber country, I know immediately what's going on. I can hear them and immediately I'm evaluating what they're saying and it's telling me that this is the message being sent, here's what's going on, I can now form a, a game plan. And this type of hunting, when we are actually hunting you know, elk during the rut, we are usually calling in eight out of 10 bulls, we're calling 14 out of 16 in. I mean, those, seriously, those are unheard numbers. Who does that hardly? And, and I'm not trying to, you know, to brag or anything, but I'm just trying to show you that by understanding their language is so much more important than you think. To run out there and try to challenge every bull, I don't care if a bull has cows or not. If you challenge every bull and a bull has cows and they're not hot, you're going to lose that battle. You might get in a little screaming match, but you're going to lose it more times than you'll ever win it. And so it wasn't just the sounds, it was when are they using these sounds? How do I know when there's a hot cow? How do I know when the elk are ruddy? How do I know when I'm dealing with a herd bull or a satellite? And, and when I hear an elk bugle, that's what I'm really evaluating. It's like boom, 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 it just clicks. And so when I know it's that kind of an elk, I know exactly what I'm going to do, how I'm going to work that bull. And I'll tell you the sounds that I'm really trying to feature. And these are some of my preparation. And even though I'm the one that, you know, writes the DVDs and, and does the CDs and wrote the book, and now we have an Elk Nut app, which I'm going to share with you guys. I know a lot of you already uh, have it here that have downloaded it. And the, and the app actually will, will help you so much. This thing is incredible for the amount of information. Those that, that have it know what I'm talking about. There is so much info on this thing to make you a better elk hunter, a better elk caller. And I stress calling a lot. And a lot of people think, oh, you can't bugle, or you can't really call elk these days. There's so much pressure. And they run from everything. But you know what they're running from? They're running from your lack of knowledge, of not knowing what you're saying. Or you are calling elk that are on the move. You're trying to call elk that just left the feeding area and heading to bedding. And you might catch these elk in transition. And so as you call to them because you hear them, they continue to put distance. It's because they're going somewhere. They're not literally running from you. But people think they are. So many hunters do. These guys are going to a destination once they leave their feeding area. Same in the evening. They leave their bedding area and come to their feeding. And so when those elk leave that area, it's not impossible, but it's really difficult to call them back where they just came from. Because you weren't there then. Those elk, if you're trying to impersonate the species. So understanding those things, where they're at at certain times, is crucial to where I'm going to set up and call or when I'm going to start bugling. Because I'm not always bugling, I'm not always cow calling. I may mix it up a little bit depending on what I'm trying to focus on. If I'm trying to target any elk, I will feature blind cold calling setup, creative cow calling setups, but that's it. For me, I like targeting bulls, so I stay away from those things because they are more likely to bring in cows, spikes, two by three, three by four bulls, and that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in at least five or six points, even on over-the-counter hunts. So I'm using specific sounds that target those bulls, and it works. It works every year. It doesn't matter where we go. We took nine more bulls this year. And again, these are all over-the-counter public land bulls. And as far as the bull sounds go, probably everybody messes with the challenge bugle. Now, let's see. You guys think about the main sounds you use when you're using a bugle. And if you don't use a bugle, you need to rethink it. You really do. The bugle is my number one tool for killing out by a mile over the cow sounds. And don't think it doesn't work. It really does. But you have to know what you're saying so that you can communicate with them, not just throw out an elk sound. Number one is I want to know how to make a challenge bugle. Now, a lot of guys, I've watched a lot of the videos where a guy goes, okay, I'm gonna send out a locator now. It's not even close to a locator. He's challenging the elk and he doesn't even know it. Because he's calling it a locator, doesn't make it a locator bugle. But so I'm gonna learn a locator bugle really well. I'm gonna learn a challenge bugle. I'm gonna learn a lip ball bugle. And when I say learn, I want to polish it up. And my last one is I need to know a roundup bugle. When I know those four sounds and I can duplicate or use any of them at any, any time, I know that I can pretty much go any direction and call just about or be part of that calling uh, communication. And, and as far as, as, as when I'm talking to elk, if I hear an elk do a roundup, I'm cow calling and a bull bugles. Almost every single time, it's a roundup bugle. So you guys think about that bugle you heard in the past. 
When you give a cow sound, if you're working an elk and he responds to it, nine times that, he's not going to the location bugle. You already knows where you're at. He's not challenging you. What is a challenge bugle? A challenge bugle is a warning. You see, it's an intimidation. It's to stay back or else. So he's not doing that to the cow. Is he giving her a lip ball? He could, but he's usually going to give a mild one. But a lip ball bugle usually doesn't come into play. It de demonstrates a lot of emotion. A lip ball is a lot of emotion. It's like if you were talking to your kid and they didn't do what you wanted them to do after the third time. You raise your voice, I told you, take out the garbage. But you didn't say that the first time. But you said, you might have said, hey, take out the garbage, son. But after a few times, you get kind of tired because they're not listening. Elk can do the same thing. That's where they change the emotion of the call to get their message across. So when I'm learning these sounds, and, pol and I already know the sounds, but I polish them up and I really work them. So when I'm going to give a location bugle, I'm going to give a sound like this that's non-intimidational. And I'll give it that long. I'm not going to give a short one. You don't need to give every bugle that long, but it's very common for bulls to use a location bugle. Why does a bull use a location bugle? There's more to it than most people even realize. They think, okay, I'm looking for elk, I'm finding elk. How do you know when a bull is using that sound? There's things you look for. And these are the things that are separating us from most hunters out there, and that's why we call so many bulls in. Here's what you're looking for. If a bull's using that sound, that bull's on the move. He is not staying in one spot bugling. He is moving, he's in search of, he is trying to find other elk. And what kind of elk is he looking for? Is he looking for another bull? No, he's looking for cows. And what cow is he looking for? Hot cows. He could care less about the rest of them. He's looking for hot cows. So when another response comes, what is he looking for as a return response? He's looking for a defensive action from another bull. That's what he's looking for. Because when a bull shows defensive action and throws out a grunt or two and a challenge bugle, he knows he's defending something. That right there tells this bull that's locating, this is where I want to be. What is he going to do? He's going to get his rear over there, and he is probably going to circle the herd and scent check the area. He wants to smell that hot cow that's in there, and that's going to get his juices going. That's all there is to it. That's what he's in search of. So when a bull is using a location bugle, he is on the move. He may bugle every 150, 200 yards. I've seen him sit there and bugle forever, and you can hear him. And I'm not even calling. I can hear him just going away and bugling, bugling, bugling. And this is what he's in search of. So that's when a bull is using a location bugle. That's when I use him. I'm walking through the woods and I'm calling. And I'm calling. Okay, I'm calling like maybe half a mile, maybe a little less. When I'm using a location bugle, if I think this is a really good drawn down into a basin, I'm going to call two, three, maybe four times from there, hoping that something will give me a response or, or its position away. Now, if I don't get a response, I move on. So I don't stay there very long. We're talking minutes, and I'm moving on to the next area where I know when I call again, I couldn't have heard from where I called last. So that's kind of how I'm doing it. I'm not, I'm not calling 100 times in the morning. It's not like that. I may call... Especially a new area, maybe 10 to 12 times. It depends on the distance I'm covering. And eventually, I usually will find the elk. And I will do this from August the 30th to September the 30th. It makes no difference. I'm going to get more response from the 6th or the 7th of September on. That's when I'm going to start really getting them to light up. Before that, really hit and miss. But I'm targeting bulls, so I really don't care about the cows and spikes, so I'm not going to calling sequences. And because I enjoy calling so much, and it's paid off over the years. I really don't care about sitting a wallow. I don't care about silly. I, I have killed bulls off of and I've, I've sat water. I've sat the, tra sat the trails, especially two or three that intersect that are leading to feeding and bedding. Those are all ways to, cut, to hunt elk when you're, when you're uh, hunting early season. And they're really a good area to hunt if you're just trying to fill a tag. So when a bull's using a location bugle, that's usually what's taking place. So now if a bull is using a challenge bugle, that's one I do try to learn as well so that when it's time to use a challenge or I hear it, I know what it is. So on a challenge bugle, it can be with or without grunts or one or two. When a bull's using grunts, he rarely uses over three, hardly never. Anything over three grunts, three, maybe even four on special occasions is a chuckle. And that's when he's going real soft or they're ape-like in sound. And that has a different meaning behind it. So a grunt is more of a, like a one grunt 
Almost like a bark, isn't it? You know, or a nervous reaction, nervous grunt. But when a bull puts them together, that is more of a challenge. It didn't sound anything like a location bugle, did it? You notice he put more intensity, more emotion. He's trying to get his point across. And when, when another bull comes in or I call and I get that response, it's game on. I know that his chances of getting an arrow at him is at least 90%. This bull's gonna be a good chance of going down. And so what I try to do is work on that challenge bugle. I know what it means, I know how to use it. The same thing when I'm working on the location bugle. And the next one that I work on, which is one I use from time to time, it comes in handy, is the roundup bugle. That bugle can be heard and used by elk at certain times. When you have, let's say that you're, you're, you're slipping in on elk. You know that there's some elk up here that you spotted, and now you're slipping in. You can see the bull up there. He's still 125 yards, and you're trying to pop through the timber, and you decide, you know something? Maybe I, I, it's getting kind of noisy. I'll call and see if he'll come over. This is just kind of an, for instance. If this bull happens to spot you because he's sneaking into the cow he hears, and he gives the roundup bugle for his elk, for his cows. What he's doing is he's rounding them up to get the heck out of Dodge. That's what he's doing. But it basically is also the sound that another bull will use to call his cows together. It's nowhere near as urgent as a lip ball. A lip ball bugle does the same thing, but under more urgent, demanding, quick action is needed now. A roundup does not require that. That's why they use another sound or, or more emotion behind it, like taking, having the kid take out the garbage for the third or fourth time. You've raised your voice and you put some serious importance or he's going to have to pay the consequences if he doesn't. So with elk, though, when there's an urgent thing, he does not mess around. He goes straight to the lip ball. Now, when you're dealing with the roundup bugle, here's what it sounds like. Whether that bull is trying to tell his cows to round up, we're getting out of there, and he usually leads the way. When he gives a roundup bugle, he's one of the few times that he'll lead the cows out of there. The cows don't lead him. But he's going to give a sound like this. That's about all he does. So he sounds almost similar to a challenge, but half, half the length of it. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. That's not going to make any difference in the woods, but it does. It makes a huge difference. And it's the same as if a bull was coming into your cow calling. You're going to hear him. You notice he gives kind of a short one. And he's letting her know. He's giving her a direction to come on over. And he may even throw some chuckling out there, which he's getting a little bit more insistent. He's excited over the situation. And again, the grunts are more like three, and they're very boisterous. A lot of times you'll hear him sucking air in. Whereas the chuckles, you don't hear that. They're more of a... So you see, and you've all heard it, but that is more of a chuckle. And the grunts are more of an intimidation. The, a bull can even use it on a cow that's uh, becoming hot in the group nearing estrus. And what he'll do is he can scold her with that one sound because it's an intimidation type sound. And if she's not listening to him, she, he, he doesn't want her to go too far away from the group or himself where he can't keep his eyes on her. He gets pretty upset because he doesn't want another bull to come in and hook her out of there. And so, you know, there's the meaning behind him, and so the reasons why I would use him, the reasons why the bull would use him. And so I'm trying to polish up those three sounds right there, making sure that I'm practice up with them the same as if I was trying to stay in shape and be in physical shape to be able to hunt. These are as important to me to know these sounds, and if I hear them out there, I know what's going on. I'm not, there's a bull out there, do you hear the bugle? And that's what a lot of people do. But to be able to knock that down a notch and say, here's what he's saying. You see, now it paints a picture in your mind's eye. Now, if I'm out there, for instance, I don't use this sound. But if I hear this sound right here, I know darn well that there's a bull that has a cow, that has cows, one's probably coming into heat, but he's being harassed by satellites. So it's painting that whole picture in my mind that there's a whole group out there. There's at least one satellite, maybe two. He gives that little intimidation. He, uh, he knows they're there. Whether he can see them physically or whether they're circling, the, flanking the herd, he's warning them to stay back or else. He knows they're there. And, of course, those bulls are just going around. They want to smell that cow. They're always scent-checking everything. And so if I hear that, 
I know exactly what's going on. I know there's multiple elk over there. I know there's other bulls. I know he's got cows. And so it's not just a bugle to me where I'm saying there's a bull over there. So now I know I have to proceed with caution. I know there's some satellites. And if I want to kill one of the satellites, I can tell you right now I'm going straight to a breeding sequence. It's as simple as that, and it's on the app, and it's a sequence that brought those bulls, those satellites over there in the first place. They know there's a hot cow. And when there's a hot cow, this herd bull is constantly talking to her. He's monitoring her, monitoring her moves. He doesn't want her to get out of his sight, not very far, or he tries to bring her back. But he might have eight or nine cows. What about the other eight? Could care less about them. They can't be bred. The bulls can come in and do anything they want. There's nothing they can do. It's that one. If there's two or three coming in at the same time, can you imagine the rut fest that you would be facing? Multiple bulls bugling out there. So what is that all about when you get to that point? You have a herd bull, you have three bulls bugling, let's say for instance, two, three, four, whatever the multiple bulls are in the area. You can tell, all right, what, what is the reason those bulls are bugling? Why are they doing that? Are they trying to fight the herd bull? No, couldn't care less. They'd walk right in and challenge and fight them if they were gonna do that and winner take all type of deal. So these subordinate or satellite bulls that are on the outskirts, you gotta remember they have the same urges as the herd bull, same thing. They would love to breed that cow, be one of those breeders just like the herd bull does. And so what they do is they stand back and they advertise themselves as a possible breeder. And when they do it, do you think that they try to be wimpy about it and go, oh, well, we don't want to chase the old Joe off the herd bull. We better tone her down a little bit. Hunters think like this all the time. When I'm bugling a bull, I'm usually trying to give everything I got when I'm messing with the herd bull. If I'm going to either challenge or lip ball and try to call his hot cow away, I do not play it down like I'm a little two and a half year old. I, I try to be a, a force to be reckoned with, a competitor. And with this I have found over the years, and we've killed over 80 herd bulls, all these on over the counter tags. This is in the elk nut team, there's five of us. And so I'm falling back on the little things that we use. Do I lip ball every herd bull? No. But when it's time for it, that is our go-to sound. So when you have those satellites up there, and those satellites are representing dominance and strength the best they can, you have to appreciate that all bulls don't sound the same. You got one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, maybe the herd bull six and a half. And so your sound needs to be believable. It needs to be the best you can be, but don't worry about it being perfect because a two and a half still has the urge that that six and a half or seven and a half year old herd bull has. He may not sound as big and as guttural and as strong, but he's still trying to show these, this hot cow that he has everything, he's throwing everything out there. He may not be one that's going to be chosen to breed, but he's given it his all and so are the others. And the interesting point, the reason they do this, what a lot of hunters don't realize is about four to six bulls will breed that cow when she comes into heat. Everybody thinks it's the herd bull doing all the breeding. That he breeds her and nothing else that he allows nothing in. This cow is in heat for 12 to 15 hours. After about five or six shots from the herd bull breeding this cow, and imagine if there's two, he's whooped, he's done. He cannot do anything else. He's done everything his manhood is gonna allow him to do. So what do these cows do? They seek out these other bulls. So these cows now go to the next one that they feel is a dominant sounding bull and they check them out. They check out their antler size, their body, and they will now choose who the breeder, the next bull is that's gonna breed her. And that's why these bulls stand back and bugle this group. They are trying to represent dominance and strength. And they do this, and yes, some of them will be selected by these cows as they come in. And that's why they hang around and do that. They are not trying to challenge the herd bull, or else they walk right in and do it. And there are bulls big enough that will go in and challenge a herd bull and win or take all. The one that moves, it loses is usually run off, and the cows now will stay with that one in most cases. And it's the same as when you have a small five point before the rut really hits and he's kind of the king of his little castle there and it's nothing for when they start coming into heat, a bigger bull come and push him away and take over. And, and because cows want to be with a more dominant structured animal that is going to breed them, it's the same as bucks. You got white tails, you got muleys. Who's breeding those does? I mean, it ain't the little fork and horns and three points unless that's all that exists, but it's usually the more mature bucks. That's the same thing in the elk world. And so when I'm working those sounds, I'm trying to make sure that I'm polishing those up. And then my lip ball, between my, between my location bugle and the lip ball, those are probably the two biggest sounds I use. 
during the year. And so I really try to make sure that I can do those as believable as possible coming from a human being. And I've never entered a world, a championship calling contest in my life. And I never will in my 60s. I ain't going to do it now. <clears throat> you know, now, so what the heck. But so what I'm trying to show you is you don't have to be a world class caller. I mean, I'm not bad. I mean, I can call. I call kinds of elk, but I'm not in the level with those guys who are so pure and so clean. I mean, they're, just, they're very impressive. But as far as when it comes to elk hunting, don't think you have to be in that category. But you also don't want to be that dork that's out there that just is whistling everything. And I mean, you know, I don't mean to say dork, but I mean, he just doesn't put any practice in it. And you can tell, you can read this guy, he's out there bugling and oh my God. You want to be that guy that people are going, is that a bull or is that a guy? You know, that's the one you want to be. You really do. You want to be believable. And so by presenting yourself, even if you don't bugle big, you can still make very clean sounds. You know the hardest sounds when you're in the elk woods and you're trying to wonder, is that a bull or is that a human? I'll tell you the hardest sound to, to, to figure that out on. And that's the weenie sound. That's the young bull sound. When you hear this sound here, you think, I mean, you, it's, it's gonna, if you've heard of young bulls bugle, and cows, cows will do the same thing. Cows will make that tone right there. Cows can bugle just like a bull can. They do both cow calls and bugles, and so does a herd bull or any bull. They can all cow call, they can all bugle. But when you get that sound right there and you're in the woods, it's, I, I mean, that's one that throws me the worst because I've heard too many young bulls sound like that. But when you hear a mature bull, is there really any question in your mind at all that if that's a bull or a human? There's none. They're guttural. It's almost unmatchable. It's un unreal. And so, you know, when you're out there in the woods, those are some of the little things that, that I look for as far as calling. But the lip ball, get back on track. This is my fourth one that I work on. And the lip ball is a sound. How many here don't know how to make a lip ball and are still practicing it? Okay, you know, they're honest. I appreciate that. And so the app will actually show you for those that are interested in getting how to make every single one of these sounds, including all the ones I'm not talking about. I, I show you how to make them all on this app. But when I'm doing a lip ball, just so that you guys know, I'm pursing my lips together kind of like if I'm going to blow a trumpet, you're going. So before you ever try with a reed in your mouth and, the, and, and a grunt tube, Use the sound of your voice. Get used to what that's supposed to sound like. You notice how small the hole is? It's like a BB. There's not, ah, oh, you're not doing that. Then you put the reed in your mouth. I have a certain spot when I'm using a reed in my mouth, I make sure I set it on my tongue. I don't throw it in there like I'm going to eat it, like it's a sandwich. I set it on my tongue and I lift it into place. And when the reed goes in my mouth, it's going to sit like that right there. It does not sit like that. It's going to be in a, about a 15, 20 degree angle. And I'm letting this seal the top of my palate. And the very front of this horseshoe opening, the latex, the dome goes up if you're using a dome. I let it hit the, the palate. If you feel, take the tip of your tongue and go to the inside of your teeth and feel that little cleft, about three eighths of an inch from your teeth. That's where the front I started. Anybody, everybody should be in that realm. You can move it around a hair a little bit, but don't shove it back anymore because that's where you start gagging and choking. So when I put it in place there, and I just barely touch the reed with my, with my tongue, I'm gonna get this sound here. <coughs> See, I barely, now if I increase <coughs> tongue pressure. <coughs> okay, at the same time I'm doing that, I'm going, <coughs> I'm throwing voice. So, <coughs> I'm trying to throw that in. So what I'm doing is going, When I put it together, there's my lip ball. So when I use the tube, it'll magnify it. So you see what I mean? So that's something to practice. That's, it's really not hard once you get the idea. It will take a little time before you spit the call around a little bit and get saliva running everywhere. And so to, in order to get the higher pitch in the front or behind it, all you do is decrease your tongue pressure. So if I'm going to put a little bit of a note in behind it, it's going to go like this. I'm going to re reduce the tongue pressure from the lip bulb. You see, all of a sudden, by reducing just enough, I now catch the tone, the high pitch that's going to carry. But see, to a bull, when I'm using lip ball, let's say I'm going to slip in and I want to call that hot cow away. 
All these other bulls are at a distance, 150 yards. I'm trying to get inside that. I'm trying to get, to, if I can get to 80, man, I absolutely love it. But I, I actually have called many herd bulls in from 200 yards away because I couldn't get any closer. The terrain just didn't allow it. And a lip ball can actually do it, but you got to get, you know, you, you have, that's when you're slow playing them before you get to the lip ball, but it can be done. But if I can get in close and I can really sell him, I don't need to go in there and cow call first and say, okay, I'm setting the stage. No, this guy's already hot. We're talking about a bull with a hot cow. I go in there. And when he answers me, I am going to challenge Bugle right over the top of him. I'm not going to usually give another lip ball because when he answers me, he's challenging me to get the heck out of Dodge. He wants me out of there. And I, I will cut him off. I will not let him finish his Bugle. And if he doesn't come fast enough, I start showing excitement. I love to pant. I notice that when I pant, and I throw out that challenge, it drives him nuts. And I usually will just pant with my voice, kind of a And I'll hit him with that. Anytime he uses a bull uses a pant, again, those are it's on the app as well. It denotes excitement. It denote it denotes frustration. He's not getting what he wants, and you'll hear him pant. And they can use it on a cow. He keeps calling a cow in with a roundup bugle. He may be using chuckles. And all of a sudden, you hear him just kind of. <laughs> you ever hear bulls do that? That's what they're telling you. They're frustrated that you're not getting over there quick enough because he's already asked you to come. When you cow call, he's not giving you those growls right off the, you know, those pants right off the bat. He doesn't do it. He's trying to call you with other measures, other sounds. And when you don't do it, he gets that frustrated attitude, just like if you were trying to get somebody to do something or at your job and they just keep not doing it. You go over there and it isn't done. I mean, you, you know, you get frustrated. Well, this is the way they show it through vocalization. So when you hear the pants, that's what's going on right there. And that's why I like introducing it. See, not many hunters ever do that. So when I'm calling elk, I like to introduce things that most people don't even think of doing. And once I do it, it kind of sells it what I'm doing. And not only that, using the right sound at the right time. Guys, it's so critical. I mean, can you imagine you're calling the bull and you don't know what, what you're doing wrong and you're right on top of him and you hit him with this. I mean, that's basically a locator. Where are you? And he already knows where you're at. You know where he's at. And we're talking about public land over the counter elk here. These guys see it all. They get so disciplined and so educated by guys blowing stuff. And then, they, and then these elk run off. And those are the guys who are saying you can't bugle bulls because they run everywhere. They just take off when I bugle. I've done four bulls this you know, week and they, none of them would come in. But they think they should come running in. And of course, you've got to work bulls. You've got to work them. And so right sound, right time, I'm not going to give him a location bugle when I've got him right there. And why do they do that? It's because they made contact with him a quarter mile away or 500 yards, and it worked there. So they get up there and they do the same bugle. You see, that's not what you want to do. It's the same when a bull and you and him are working. You ever get in a heated exchange and notice his notes are getting shorter and shorter, but louder and louder? I mean, he's getting worked up. He's changing a little bit. And the ultimate... The ultimate sound over a challenge bugle. You would think, okay, the challenge is the pinnacle. Nothing gets meaner, more rugged, calling out than that. That's not true. There's one more sound that goes above that. And on that sound right there, that is how I killed, or my son killed that bull. I pulled that bull in at the last, at the last stage on this particular one from about 100 to 110 yards to an 18 yard shot in a matter of seconds. And I had been working this bull for almost 30 minutes. And it was that final sound and I knew what it was gonna take because he wouldn't come in fast enough. And that sound is a nervous grunt followed by the roundup or a near roundup to challenge bugle because when the bull gives that sound, if you've ever had him do it, he is now challenging you the ultimate challenge. It's to go face to face, and usually there's cows involved. It's a face-to-face -face battle. I'm meeting you here, you're meeting me, right there where the line is drawn, and whoever wins takes the reward of the cows. And that is when a bull uses that sound. So you don't use it on every elk. But here's the sound that I've used. As a matter of fact, that bull was killed with it, and so was my son killed another one with a, uh, with a longbow that I called in. And I told, some of you guys might have heard that story. I told it last night. But here is the sound that was the clincher 
of working these elk for almost 30 minutes. And this is it here. <coughs> That right there, you put those two together and you think, well, that ain't nothing. Do it to a bull. When you get in that position, remember, right bull, right time. You're right with that herd bull or with the bull. And, and in this case, you know, these are, that's a big bull there. Obviously, he had cows somewhere on the other side. And the other one had about six cows that we ended up seeing. It was the five by six that he shot with the longbow. But that one was 25 yards. This one was 18. And that's a 345 and 4 eighths bull. It's not, you know, just a small bull. So we're just showing you that you can make these sounds work. One was an Idaho one. This one's a Wyoming bull. But just showing you no matter where you go, if you hit the sounds. Now, if I'd have started with that sound 200 yards away, it wouldn't have had even close to that impact. Nothing whatsoever. And so that's the importance of being able to use that sound when you need it, just like if you're gonna use a roundup bugle. Sometimes when I go in and I think the bull, he has a hot cow, but he's not really aggressive. He's really kind of downplaying a little bit. She maybe just barely leaking at this time. He knows she's not ready to be bred, but he's bugling enough. I'm listening to this. I'm listening to all what he's telling me out there. Then I may have to work him up. And so I may go with the, uh, the roundup bugle right then and there. I won't go to, straight to a lip ball. And when a bull does that, I like throwing in two or three cow sounds. And you know, this is some of the blessing of being in elk country for so many years and hunting them and listening to all these little idiosyncrasies. But I've watched bulls, I've watched satellites sneak in pretty close and you'll hear them, they'll kind of do this. <coughs> you ever hear bulls do that? Those younger ones especially. They'll come in and give a couple cow calls and give that little short roundup because they're trying to pull that cow out of there. Not any cow. Those same bulls and those herds were right there for days. No action going on. But when a cow starts showing signs of estrus, that's when it starts picking things up. Their testosterone levels, I mean, these guys have been ready to breed ever since they started rubbing their velvet off. And that's how t the testosterone levels work on a bull. When the velvet starts coming off, they're getting ready to breed. And it can raise daily or not. Every bull is different. There's times you can walk out there and bugle and pull a bull a half a mile away out of nowhere. Other times you hear a bull at that distance or closer and there's nothing in the world you can do to pull them in because they have different personalities just like you and I do. They're not, they're, they're, they're not robots. They're not a mechanical thing where everything does the same thing at the same time. No, their levels of testosterone can change and be different from animal to animal. That is why I find it so important to be able to know those key sounds. I'm going to share some cow sounds too. Those key sounds so that right animal, right sound. Not animals bugling any sound. No way. I'll, I, I've done that before. And I've been in the boat where many of them, you know, you just don't call many of those elk in. And on the cow sounds, here's the three sounds that I want to do very, very well. And for me, I'm saving the best sound for last that I want to share with you. This, this last sound that I will share has put more bulls on the ground than any other sound I've ever used. And that includes the elk net team, the five of us. It's the last sound a bull hears. And I'll share that one with you. But right now, for cow sounds, I like being able to just to make air, normal cow sounds, social cow talk. So you need to know the difference between a social cow talk, a regathering mew, or a contact buzz. Everyone have their own separate message. This is why they use these different sounds. Any elk can make these sounds, any cow, any bull. But when you're hearing social cow talk, it's, it's something similar to this. And you notice I'm using the same read for everything. I like doing that. As an elk hunter, it's so important to me to have an all-purpose read. And it doesn't mean it's the best read in the world, but I can make every sound a cow or bull makes with that. And so if I'm in crunch time and I'm like, oh, I need a cow sound or I need a bull sound, he's coming right there. I'm not wanting to, you know, moving is the worst thing you can do. And so you are, you're, you're pinned down sometimes, so I like to make sure that this read will do everything. I do like cow sounds coming out of a different read. If I'm just doing cow sounds and I'm the caller, I would switch to what I call, it's the mellow yellow from Rocky, Jacobson Bugling Bullets. I, I really like that read. But for the all-purpose read, I like this one here. It's called The Mistress. But it'll do just fine on cow sounds, and here they are.
This is just general cow talk. A lot of times when they're moving from bedding to feeding, you will hear them communicate because they're going through the timber a lot and they don't see each other. And so they will go ahead and talk to each other, mom talking to junior, junior talking to mom, mom talking to the rest, and they all know each other. So that's one really nice thing is to know that all elk know each other in their area by their sound. If you walked into that area, and I've done this a lot of times as testing, and see 40, 50 elk in June, July, you can hear them talking. And I'm maybe 100, 125 yards, and you can just see them. And they're all talking like crazy in some of these little meadows, and I'm in the timber, and I mean they're going like nuts, and I go over there and I go, that's it, nothing else. Half those heads stop and just look. You know why? They don't know who I am. Immediately they heard a sound. How do they know that? Isn't that crazy? But they do. And I've done this many a times, even with smaller groups, large groups, it doesn't matter. But they know each other. And so when you hear them talking like that, this is, that's their communication, is, is, is through uh, their, their cow calling. Now if Junior got pushed around a little bit and she couldn't find him, she's going to do what I call, and I have it written in the playbook there from years ago, it's called the regathering mew. And so the ma changes the tone, or any cow can change the tone if she's not getting a satisfactory response when they're supposed to be talking and keeping track of one another. And that sound is, it lengthens out a little bit. And it's very common for her to do two, four, or five of them. And it sounds like this. You notice how she lengthened it out. And, and, and she's looking for them because they're not responding to the other sound. And so that's really what's going on when you hear sounds like that. And so that regathering, you can actually call other elk towards you. If you know they're out there, they can't see your position. You can bring them, oh, you are asking for assistance or aid or for them to come over. The cow calling, social, asks nothing. It just says there's cows there and they're talking. But you can actually ask them to come over. And you can do it in a more demanding tone when they go to the contact buzz. I have a lot of footage of this sound through May, June, July, where when bigger groups are getting separated from one another or they want to join and they're giving them a direction, that's where they go to the contact buzz. And you've heard it before, other terms of being called an estrus buzz. Some people even say that it's a, a breeding sound. Well, it's not. There are no sounds that a cow will make, no matter how much you want to believe it, that says she's ready to be bred. None. There's no estrus whine. Those are just names. I can make, I can make a name and make it say anything I want. Just like a guy giving a, a challenge bugle all the time he says he's locating. You can say anything you want, but a sound represents one thing. So if an estrus buzz or a contact buzz was a breeding sound, would you be hearing it in May? Would you hear it through January, February, March? No. They're not breeding then. Why would they use a breeding sound? Because they don't. It's more of a communication sound. And I actually use it as a locator sometimes. But for the most part, when I'm trying to get, if I've got on a bull, and this has sealed the deal for me many times, I've been working a bull and I'm slipping in, slipping in, and, I, and, and I'm not really sure if this bull has cows, so I don't really lip ball them. I don't want to get too aggressive because I'm not sure. Yeah, I run into those situations. I'm not sure if that is a herd bull or not. So when I'm not, I play, I'll slow play it. I'll keep it down because I can always build. But once I get here, I can't come back down to any effectiveness. And so I'm going to give him that. And he knows I'm trying to call him over. That right there has brought a lot of bulls in that were hanging up. You see, I changed my sound. He knows I'm talking to him. Cows will do it amongst each other as well. There, again, you go to, to, to YouTube and go to some of those RMEF videos, they're so awesome, and you'll see these elk at all times of the year using that sound. But for some reason, years ago, guys have kind of put that in because they hear it in September just as well, but they put that saying that that's a cow ready to be bred, and it's not. Because, like I say, doesn't it all have to fit? All the pieces of the puzzle have to fit. And if they're doing it in these other non-breeding months, why all of a sudden in this month it's a breeding sound? It's not. No more than the rest of the cow sounds. Well, I've done that sound and the bulls went nuts. Well, you know what? I've done that sound and they went nuts. Is all of a sudden a breeding sound? No. That's what I'm trying to show you. It depends on the bull, but no, it's not. It's just a cow sound. And bulls, when it comes to September, they're all wanting to scent check these cows. They want to test them. When bulls, especially satellites that don't have cows, 
they are on those trails that these groups are using. They go to the water areas where they're watering, where they're bedding, where they're feeding, and they're scent checking every single area out there. Not only are they waiting for herd bulls to be defensive or breeding sequence in their sound, they are scent checking areas. And so they know when something is coming in. And so, I mean, this is what's happening out there. It isn't all just, you know, a sound only. And so anyway, that's the, the contact buzz. I really try to, to uh, uh, make sure I can use it cleanly. I, I'm the kind of guy that I want to make sure that I don't want to have to make two or three sounds before the right one comes out. So it takes practice. And it's the same as any of those bull sounds or any of those cow sounds. So what I try to do, like I say, is I polish up on those. They are as important to me as making sure that I'm physically fit and able to cover country in the woods you know, and not have any limitations. And it's not uncommon for me to hunt 20 or 21 straight days. All these elk that I've talked about that we've taken, I've never bivy hunted one day, zero. It's not that I haven't wanted to, but haven't needed to. All these elk are taken by us going in the woods. And many days, if the wind is bad, we are back out by one or two. In many other cases, we're hunting till dark, but we've never had to bivy hunt for two, three, four days. And I really attribute a lot of that that I don't babysit elk. When I find elk, where my son and I are together, we hunt a lot together, and it's just usually the two of us or by ourselves. We are not hunting in groups. There's not five or six of us and we got video guys. There's nothing like that. I'm a hunter just like you guys are. We go out and we park here and we go up there. I mean, we have nothing, nobody telling us anything. And we go in these areas and we find these elk. I do not try to find five, six, seven elk to kill one. When I hear one bugle, I really feel in my heart that that bull is going to die. That's all I need to hear is one sound. I don't need to hear a bunch of stuff because there's other things that I can go into, other sequences. When I hear one bull bugle a quarter mile away and that's all he said, maybe he gave a second, I'm usually going to go to an advertising sequence, no cow calling. And I'm going to try to get within two, 250 yards of that bull. I don't need to be any closer. And you're going to find these things happen to you like the first six, seven days of September. A few of those dry days in the middle of September, when you go two, three, four days and you don't hear a sound, those guys are still killable. Why is that? Because they know that it's, whether it's pre-rut or rutting time, it's breeding time. And so these bulls need to know where they fit in the pecking order. They know, just like I explained in the beginning, that when you get three or four bulls bugling around a herd, they have an opportunity to breed one of those cows if they're chosen. So these bulls, they're just like horses, they know that they're here, they're here in the pecking order, or here, or number three, four, five, six, and only so many of them are gonna be breeders. So when you go in there and represent a new kid on the block, those bulls need to know who you are because they know each other by sound, sight, or smell but they don't know your sound. So they're like, who the heck is that? So they want to come slipping in. And as many bulls as I've called in, I, they're in here. I wish I could show them because there was a, I mean, we've called a bunch of them in. I don't even know where I'm at now, what I hit. My point is, is that using that advertising type sequence as a new kid on the block gets their dander up. They need to see who you are. They're extremely curious when a new bull enters an area, and it's not uncommon. Bulls, I mean, elk are getting pushed by humans everywhere. In some areas, wolves, mountain lions, bears, they get pushed around. And so it's not uncommon to have another elk move into a new area. And so when I go in there and I'm representing that, I have that breeding sequence, I should, or advertising sequence. I wish I could pull that up right there. Oh, hey, look at that. These are just elk that, are, that guys have sent us. Some of them are ours. But uh, I, I don't know where the other one is. But the point is, is that going through that advertising sequence promotes them to want to come and size you up. That's what they want to do. And in most cases, when I'm bringing bulls in, I have brought in two and three and four different satellites that were in those bachelor groups to come over to see. And I, all I did was hear one out there, you know, an hour ago. But I don't give up on that bull because I know he's there. And don't you think I've tried over the years, okay, I'll get in there and cow call? It, it doesn't even budge him half the time. And it's because they know there's no hot cows in the area. They're not dumb. There'd be multiple bulls bugling everywhere if there was hot cows in the area. And so what I'm going to do is I'm targeting that bull. 
Because if I go in and do some cow sounds, what are the odds that I'm going to pull a cow or cows, spike something young in first? Pretty good. Because there's way more of those out there than there are five or six point bulls. Way more. And so I'm trying to use bull sounds to try to pull a bull over. And I'll bet you there's times that I don't even know that I probably pulled another bull over that wasn't even the one I heard bugle. Because you just never know. There's elk out there. They're not by themselves. They're herd animals. So anyway, those are some of the things that I try to fall on. I use those cow sounds. I use those bull sounds. And I try to polish up those ones because I know I'm going to use them more than anything. And as far as the other additional elk sounds, again, all I want to do is to be able to understand their definition or their meaning behind them. And that's why on the app I have 21 different sounds. And you, I probably showed six or seven of them, of the ones I tried to play, play on each year. And so, but being able to identify those sounds when I hear them, it helps me to form that plan of how I'm going to handle it next. And it makes me, it helps me to form it quickly. You know, another interesting point I've, I've picked up over the years, a lot of times you hear a guy and they'll say, when you hear a bugle, you need to get over there as fast as you can. Well, I'm a firm believer of that in some bugles, but I'll give you a little tip. I have found over the years, and you know, there's always something that goes the other way, but the majority of the time, the odds are really, really high that when you get a response from a bull that gives a challenge bugle, he's not apt to run. He's going to hold tight. That bull, you have time to get over there, make your way, maybe set up. It depends on if he's aggressively still bugling or why he challenged in the first place. Was he answering you? Was, was he answering another bull? But the point is, is he usually stays right there. But when I've called and had a bull give a lip ball bugle, it's usually a totally different ball game. If you don't get over there within minutes, the next time you hear him bugle, he's going to be almost half again as far or, and continually to move. And it, will he answer when you bugle? Oh, yeah. But he's here, and he's here, and there's no keeping up with him, especially if it's a steep mountain. But those are the things I look for that has taught me this over the years. When I hit a lit, hear a lit ball, i got to get over there right now really quick because I only have maybe six, seven minutes that, depending on the size of the herd, when he lit ball because, because I bugled, he's calling his cows together for possible get out of Dodge. He's leaving. And so he's pulling together. And I've also noticed that the larger the group of cows, the more he will lip ball. If he lip balls like one time in a minute, he probably only has a couple of cows and they're already over there and they're ready to leave if they want to or they're on the move. You never know. It's the pressure you can put on them may say, okay, now I'm getting out of here. Or sometimes it's just, it's just your one response back once he be lip balls and they're out of there. He's not, he's avoiding any and all confrontations. So those are the little things. But when I hear a bull lip ball two or three times inside a minute, I know he's got a lot of cows because he's urgently trying to get them all together. He doesn't want to just take off and leave the others behind. So he's trying to pull them together. So listen to those little things when you're in the woods. Am I hearing a challenge? Am I hearing more than one lip ball? And I'm trying to act. I remember last year, my son and I were going up, and I mean, it was steep. We were covering already 1,500 feet. It was benching. I had bugled and we stopped to take a snack. I always seem to, I want to call when I, when, when I take a snack, you know, just in case something comes sneaking in. And I've been caught, I don't know how many times it comes slipping in, I didn't even hear them. And they do show sometimes. But the point being is, in this one instance, I had given a bugle and a bull gave a bugle back. And it was, it was pretty far. I would say he was five or 600 yards. I heard him, but I couldn't hear what he said. You know, and that happens. It's not like, oh, every bugle you hear, I can evaluate that real quick. It's sometimes you just don't hear enough of it or you can't hear additional sounds. And sometimes I need that. I need to hear the additional sounds. And I thought, ah, eh, we'll just wait. We're snacking right now. Out of nowhere, about five minutes goes by and my son looks at me, he goes, dad, the guy just lit balls. I said, really? He goes, yep, that guy's gone. And so, I mean, just showing you how he knows the same thing. And it's nice when your kid's only that big and he's hunted with you all his life and he's 39 now. You know, he knows, I mean, where did he learn it from? Me, so, I mean, we, we know everything together, and so we're always on the same page, and you couldn't have a better hunting partner. When, when, when you guys are all in sync and you hear something, and you almost have the same decisions every time, this is what we gotta do, this is, and it's nice to see that he's carrying that torch like that, that he's learning those things, and he is really, really good. He's, he calls a lot of elk in. But basically, understanding all these things and, and being able to apply them, you guys, Definitely make use of that bugle. It is one of the best tools you will ever own. Your bugle, some of those cow sounds, and, and, and who here has the app? Okay, so a couple of you have the app. I can see right now that 
way more hands need to be raised than that. And I'm not kidding you. I, I want to show you just a couple features on it. It takes just like two minutes. And I'm going to show you what's on this thing. And I assume that's coming up. So, if you go to the home page on it, you're going to see elk sounds. And on elk sounds, if I were to touch it, just to show you some of the features right there. And I'll go up to like the lip ball bugle here. As you can see, it, these are all bull sounds that are on the app. And you notice where it says video? There's a short video clip, 30 to 90 seconds sound, uh, long, on every one of these sounds that we show you how to make that sound. So if you don't know how to make a roundup bugle with a reed and what part of your tongue to use, or a challenge or a location, or nervous grunt, glunking, we need to, we need to cover nervous grunt. Panting, all this, this is bulls. You wanna hear a bull panting? You ever hear a bull pant? Let's see if we can hear it on the speakers here. Here we have a bull that's going to be panting. Listen to him. Okay. Now, we'll go here. You see, you can hear how they'll do it, and, and we kind of cut the bugle part. A lot of times they bugle right after it, but I just wanted to isolate those sounds, and those are real elk making that sound. So if you want to try to simulate that sound, or if you want to try to imitate, let's go back to, I'll pick one where you guys can hear it really good, the lip ball, and you want to hear, let's go to audio on it, and so I want to hear it. Let's see, I went to growls, didn't I? Lip ball. There it is. So we're going to hear a lip ball. We're going to play it. This is a bull. And if you notice on that app, I give the lip ball. I give a sound on every one of these, whether it's a cow or bull. Now I'm going to show you my version of it, of I'm giving a lip ball. Okay, so now if you say, hey, I want to be able to make that sound. I want to practice it. What you would do is go to the record. You see where it says record at the bottom? Now let's see how you sound. So in other words, I would click this. And I want to hear myself now. So now I'm going to say, how am I doing with it? So see, now I can compare myself. I guess I should stop it. Hear myself there. Because it has a stop button right there and I didn't hit it. But you see, the thing is you can do that on every single sound. You can say, hey, I want to know how to do some of the glunts, or I want to know how to make sure I'm doing a good challenge bugle. I want to hear the bull make it. All the way to the roundup bugle, to nervous grunts, all the cow sounds, way more than we covered. And so I'm just showing you here that it has all those options. In, in addition to that, if you go to the sound on this one here where it says lip ball, you'll go to the tip section. Now you notice it says, what does it mean when I hear it? When do I use this sound? How should I respond if I hear it? If you click on them, notice the written content there. So now you have written content of what to do, of what that sound means to the elk. If you want to hear when do I use this sound, you'll now have all written content right there. And it will explain in detail. Every single sound shows that. It will have the written content of the message being sent, how to handle it, and different options. You can use the sound. All the se sequences are on there. I should just give you just a real quick, you'll see it, so you can appreciate what it, what it is. So if I went to sequences and I said, okay, we're going to go ahead and do a breeding sequence, people want to know what that means. So now you'll see a video come up, and I'm in the field, and I'm going to show you how to do the sequence. So I don't want to take the whole thing, but we go, there's about a seven minute video there and I go exactly through the sounds you need for a breeding sequence. All the cow sounds, which are dominant bull sounds, but you're going to go through both along with the rake and stomping. Everything about it is going to be in that clip and it's going to explain in detail when you use it, when you don't use it. And that's why there's sequences there. You'll notice that when I was on there, man, I wish I wasn't so old and could see I can't believe how terrible it is. Sometimes I need my glasses to find my glasses. And I'm not kidding you. So back on the sequences, 
You'll notice there's a cold calling sequence, advertising, breeding, and a creative cow calling. Every one of them have that information on it. And so, and this app, with all that on there, would take you hours to go over it all. It's $4.99, and you own it for life. And once you have it downloaded, it's yours. You can use it in the woods. You do not need Wi-Fi. It, all you need is battery source. So if you hear a bull out there or a cow and you can't identify it, you can go right through the sounds until you hear it and say, that's the sound I'm hearing right there. And you then go to the first tip, and it's going to tell you the message being sent. And here's what you do next. Here's how you handle it. In time, you're going to be just like a lot of us that have hunted for years. You're not going to really need the app for every little move. Maybe some of the things that are rare, but in many instances, this will help cut your learning curve down beyond your imagination. So, I mean, I'd really seriously consider it. We put a lot of time putting this together, and this thing is worth its weight in gold for $4.99. And there's no membership. There's no yearly fee. There's nothing. Once it's $4.99, that's it. And now with the, we have, what, coming in Monday, we have how to hunt and when to hunt wallows, water sources, mineral licks, how to set up on them. What time of the month is best for those types of areas to hunt? Because, you know, a lot of people like to hunt from stands, ground blinds. And so we have that feature. We have full moon tactics, when to hunt it, when not, what to look for, things that what are myths, what aren't. We have uh, the beginner elk hunter tips, and there's just how to pick an area, a state, how to pick how to, what the, the questions to ask a game biologist, how to pick an area according to your physical abilities. Maybe you're in good shape, but you're taking 65, 70 year old dad and he can't hump some of that area. And so you talk to the game biologist and you get the areas that you can traverse and then you look for areas that don't have tra trails and roads. They will tell you and respond to those questions. But to say, where are the elk? How many people hunt? They don't care about it. They hear that all the time. But my point is, is that the tips in that will show you so much how to pick an area so much quicker along with all the elk hunting content. So let's, before I go, you guys want to know the number one sound that puts most of the elk on the ground. That's the nervous grunt. The nervous grunt, you should be able to make it with your voice. You should be able to make it with a reed. You should be able to make it with a reed in your tube because you never know when you're going to get caught with no reed in your mouth. And by doing it with your voice, when I use this sound, see the nervous grunt, ask an action. If you're going to use a cow sound and, you, and you're bringing a bull in or your caller's bringing a bull and he's coming in, he's slipping through, slipping through, I don't care if he's 15 yards or he sees 55 yards, whatever, as he's slipping through there and you need him to stop in a lane, the further out he is, the worse a cow call is going to be effective because it's not very loud. And he's moving, he's coming through. Not only that, a cow call does not ask anything. It doesn't say, what are you? It just... It doesn't ask anything. The nervous grunt does. We've all heard it. You've heard a bull kind of... <coughs> that single note. You're calling him and he gets to a spot where he thinks he should see you. You've called him to that point. Maybe you've bugled. He's coming, coming. And he's like, I see about where the source of the calling has come from. I don't see anything. That's when he hits you with that. I want to see you. I want a visual. I need a comforting response to know you're not a threat. I need to know you're an elk. And that's when he uses that sound. That's why it's such an effective sound to anchor a bull right between two trees in a window. And we've killed close to 40 to 50 bulls when that's the last sound they ever heard. It stops them on a dime. We've stopped elk with that sound over 150 yards away. I mean, when they hear that sharp blast, it just locks them up because it's asking. It's asking something of them. Whereas a cow sound does not do that. It doesn't mean a cow sound won't ever stop them. But this does, and if you're going to do it with your voice, it doesn't have to be perfect. You suck air in, and I show it on that app. I show, show how to do it with your voice and everything, but you kind of give it that, <laughs> and that's what I do. And many times I've had bulls coming right in. They came in so quick on me that I could not draw on them. You've ever had that happen? I mean, they're not supposed to come in that quick. I mean, they're supposed to come in slower, and, you know, I can set up. But I've had him come in so quick that I'm sitting there, and he's just right there, and he's staring everything down, and I can see him heaving, and, just, and, and you know, just the steam coming out, and he's right there 15, 20 yards, and I don't move a muscle. But he knows something's not right. And what is he going to do? He's going to go back the way he came. And why? because it was secure. He's not going to keep coming over. He's not going to run off that way. In most cases, he hardly ever does. He runs back where he knows it was safe. And so what I do is I sit there and I don't get impatient. He's facing me. I'm not even drawn yet. I'm sitting right here. And as soon as he turns to leave, because I know he's going to leave, I 
go ahead and draw, and I give him that nervous grin at the same time. I was, <laughs> just like that, and he'll just, I've asked him to see him, and he's going to turn, and I mean, he does it almost every time. I've had a bull only one time I couldn't kill when he was that close, and that dirty sucker turned like that right over his back, and I had no shot, and when he did, I'm like, oh, what do you do? You can't say, can you turn a little more? I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, he's right there, and when he saw me, I'm sure my eyes are as big as his. I'm not kidding, and that was the, one of the only bulls I've never been able to take or call for a shooter. And that bull just blew out of there. I mean, how, how could you have a bull that close and not even do anything? It just happens. But so many times they do this, or they take a step to look. How did they miss you? I killed two bulls that blew up out of their bed, and I had my reed in my mouth, blew up out of their bed, which I didn't know they were there. They never called when I called before. And on two different instances, they both ran out to 30, 40 yards and right into the timber. And, and fortunately, I walk around with a reed in my mouth, and I just went, <coughs> And in both those instances, which were two years apart, Bull walked right back out to see how did he miss me. And he looked over there, and I shot both of those bulls with a bow. And so, you know, it's just those little things sometimes. And what if I were to give a cow sound? I'm not saying it wouldn't have worked, but it doesn't ask an action. This does. This is saying I want to visual to make sure that you're what I think you are or hope you are. Are you an elk? And, and that's what he's really doing. You know, bulls get fooled all the time. And so with the hunting pressure, they don't know if you're, uh, what's making the noise out there. They see something or a flash, and so they'll give you that sound right there to, uh, to confirm that you're not a threat. And so with that being in case, you know, there's wolves, there's bears, there's mountain lions, are they going to respond back like that? Nothing. And when they don't get that, off he goes. So to calm them down, you can actually do that or to stop them and at least give, your, give yourself a chance. Otherwise, you have no chance. So don't be so ready to throw that. That, that proverbial towel in. Man, just think of any little thing and prepare yourself that those are things you might be able to fall back on. I know that calling contest is coming up and I can rattle on all night about elk hunting. So, hey guys, I really, really appreciate everybody uh, coming by and showing your support. Yes, sir. One question. Once you download the app, I know you do upgrades on it, how do you get the upgrades? You go right to the app store and it will tell you if there's an update. Like I have an iPhone, I go straight to the app store and it'll go to Elknut and it'll say you have an, an update or two or, I think the Androids, they some of them. They ask it, they always ask it. Upload they do, it. man. You just upload, upload 10, 20, whatever you want. Yeah, so, and they're all free uploads, you guys, so it's pretty cool. But, but again, thank you very much for coming in. I really, really appreciate it a lot. <laughs>